Have you ever had a hot take? An opinion that was spicy or went against the grain that you may have been afraid to speak aloud, lest your peers bully you? Or, uh, whatever this is. Anyway, in today's landscape of the internet and social media, hot takes have never been more prevalent. It's never been easier in the history of mankind to shout an opinion into the ether and mute the post before anyone can yell at you for it. And while some hot takes further necessary discussions and push the envelope, others probably should never have come into the world to begin with. And when it comes to our favorite platform fighter, Super Smash Bros. Ultimate, there are a lot of hot takes that should have just remained inside thoughts. To help me find some of these hot takes, I went to their home world, Twitter. And I put out a post asking the Twitter Smash community for their hottest, their spiciest, their most tongue-searing takes. And in this video, we'll be going through them together. But before we get started with that, let's get the elephant out of the room. Hi, I'm back from my extended break. I spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to revamp and reboot this channel. And you're watching the first video of Rister Mice version 2. It's good to be back. Some of the most important things I worked on during this break was getting a real camera at my setup, revamping my microphone settings, and vastly improving my editing, as you'll hopefully be able to tell. But these upgrades have thoroughly drained my wallet, and if you'd like to help me out with that predicament, all you need to do is support the video. Go ahead and give it a like, and subscribe if you haven't already. And hey, if you've got a hot take related to Smash that you want to share, why not drop it in the comments? I may decide to make a sequel to this video and use the comments to do so. All right, with that said, let's get into the video. Here are Smash's hottest takes. Our first hot take comes from B, who says that every character between top 30 to 65 is about equally viable and can easily pop off if the right player comes along. Arguing over placements in this range is basically pointless, and boils down to what characters you know better more than any real difference in viability. So this is a statement that I actually somewhat agree with. Obviously there's 20 or so characters who are the clear defined top tiers of the game, and there are 20 or so characters that are the clear defined bottom tiers. But the middle bits of tier lists are always the most divisive and the hardest to make. I think Kony was the one who made a tier list where he had a top tier and then an everyone else tier. Characters that we've traditionally placed in mid tier like Bowser Jr. or Toon Link are now blowing up because of dedicated character specialists. And I think something similar could happen to any mid tier if someone skillful and dedicated enough decides to invest in them. If I ever do make another tier list, my mid tier section is probably going to be very big and very unordered because at that point, it's just a question of which characters have representation and which don't. Our next hot take comes from Phantom Menace, who says that Sephiroth is the worst DLC character as he is the only one without a proper person maining him and getting meaningful results, compared to all the others. Also, most times he is counterpicked to in top level, he loses. Examples, Tweak and I think Ken, but to be fair, it's been a min. So for some reason, I see a lot of Sephiroth Doomer posting these days. People think that he's low tier, even bottom 10. He's the worst DLC character and he just can't do it. Apparently, no one remembers the time that Ken won Battle of BC4, a major, with Sephiroth. Now, to be 100% fair, it wasn't solo Seth, as Ken used Sonic to make top 8. But once in top 8, it was all Sephiroth, as Ken piloted the character to defeat Shuton and T twice, both the Pac-Man and the Kazuya, on the way to winning his first major outside of Japan. And Tweak Sephiroth was no slouch back in the day. At Smash Summit 6, Tweak piloted the character against Big D in his prime, and Seph was crucial for winning both the set in the group stage and in winner's finals. Not to mention, in grand finals versus Akola, Tweak went solo Sephiroth, and that grand set went to a game 9. It's obvious to me that, if someone really wanted to, they could win a major with solo Sephiroth. The only thing that's changed is that Sephiroth's representatives have drifted away from him. These days, Ken or Tweak really only pull him out as a last resort, when they feel they have no other option. For a perfect example of this, look no further than Watch the Throne. Both sides of Loser's Quarters saw these players go up against maybe the one matchup where they feel desperate enough to attempt 
against Sephiroth, Ken in the Sonic Ditto against Sonics, and Tweak facing off against Ecola's Steve. Both of these sets saw the two players starting off with Sephiroth, losing, and then swapping back to their main, only to lose the set anyways. Truth of the matter is, Sephiroth is a very hard character. He's high maintenance. And I won't be surprised if Tweak and Ken never play him again. And when it comes to these two players specifically, that's the correct call. What I'm trying to say is that Sephiroth doesn't have very many results because his old reps have dropped him to focus on their mains. And Sephiroth isn't exactly the most appealing character to pick up this late in the meta. Not because he sucks, but because he's hard. Next up is Super Racer 2048, who says matchup charts and tier lists are not an excuse for losing. And here's the thing, I kind of agree and kind of disagree. I believe that for low to mid-level competition, think locals and smaller scale regionals, the better player will typically just win. Heck, Ganondorf mains win locals all the time. But when we get to a higher level of competition, we can't pretend that some characters just have more tools than others, or that some matchups aren't more skewed than others. And while I think these things are able to be overcome, I think it's closely related to how much time you put into this game. Technically speaking, I don't think anyone needs a secondary to succeed. But if you think that picking up a secondary character would be easier than learning the matchup with your main, perhaps because you don't have the time or motivation to, I think that's perfectly valid. But I suppose that's not necessarily what Super Racer was arguing. And ultimately, I agree that if you lose a matchup and immediately start complaining about it, that's less valid. Do you know how many times I've seen a Little Mac main complain about a matchup? And it's like, bro, you chose to play Little Mac fully knowing what his matchup spread and place on the tier list was. Why are you complaining about this like you didn't sign up for it? Hey look, it's a hot take from fellow YouTuber Fire the Pyro, who you may know for these excellently made videos about me brawler. Fire the Pyro says that people need to start having stronger opinions on their stage lists. Seeing the same 7 to 8 stages across 95% of rule sets is boring. Start using rule sets that lean into the meta you want, not the meta we have, i.e. ban Kalos in town. At first, this makes a lot of sense. People hate camping, and long stages support camping, so by banning Kalos in town, we're moving towards a faster paced meta, right? Well, wrong. Don't forget that Fire the Pyro plays me Brawler, and both Town and Kalos have some of the tallest ceilings in the competitive legal rule set. This tricky me Brawler main is trying to get one over on us by removing the worst stages for Thrupper. And yeah, I guess that is advocating for the meta that you want Fire, but let me tell you something, that's not the meta I want. So, to prevent that specifically from happening, I'm on team tall ceiling all the way. Kansas City native JP22 has a hot take, saying that if Squad Strike was the singles format from the beginning of the game, it would have led to a healthier and better meta. It would have promoted fundies and would nerf all the best characters in the game right now, like Steve, Sonic, and Kazuya. It also would have promoted really cool and unique team comps. So while I don't necessarily agree that Squad Strike should be the default singles format, allow me to spread some Squad Strike propaganda. Squad Strike is by far my favorite side bracket in Ultimate, even more so than doubles, both to watch and compete in. And I think JP made some pretty good points. It does promote fundies on a fundamental level, since you're practicing multiple characters. And I really like how team comps come together. And I think the somewhat gimmicky teams, like having all three links or all three spaces, is also really fun. It's a shame that Squad Strike isn't ran at most majors, and I think the reason for that is that you can't play Squad Strike online, effectively gutting practice. Honestly, huge bag fumble from Sakurai there. Our next hot take comes courtesy of DTP, who says that if SBF and Hollow Bastion were in the game at launch, we would be running a hazards on rule set but that unfortunately, people are too tunnel visioned on PS2 to even consider the possibility now. So I actually saw quite a few responses advocating for hazards on, and me personally, I don't get it. Okay, let's assume we use the stage list that DTP proposed in this hot take. So we have Battlefield, SBF, FD, Hollow, Smashville, and Town. Battlefield, SBF, and FD are completely unaffected by hazards. Hollow Bastion gets a purely cosmetic but potentially distracting stage transformation once one player goes on last stock. Town gets some pointless balloons flying overhead, carrying no food, kind of like Shy Guys in Melee. And lastly, Smashville platform moves around. 
So call me old fashioned, but I think having Smashville's platform move around makes it a worse stage competitively, not a better one. So we lose PS2, by far the most popular stage in the entire game, and we lose the ability to experiment in the future with stages like Wily's Castle, all for the sake of a moving platform on Smashville. Yeah, sorry, I really do not see the benefits of running stage hazards. It kind of reminds me of multiverses stages, though obviously nowhere as egregious as that. Next is Mr. Lethal, who says that MKLeo isn't washed, he's doing the long-term content throw. He won every tournament in ult for a few years, now he's going to lose, just to lull everyone into a false sense of security. Then one day soon, he's going to JV4 every game in a tournament, just like Larry Lur. I... uh... I hope you're right. Yeah, that's all I'm gonna say. I really hope you're right about that. DDD Pressed is here to deliver our next hot take, saying that heavy matches are the only entertaining thing to watch during tournaments and top tier matches are hella boring. Are you and I watching the same game? You're gonna look me in the eyes and tell me that Cola beating MKLeo and Light at Collision 2024 was not insanely hype? You're seriously gonna look me dead in my eyes and say that with a straight face? I think you may just not like video games. Our next glorious insight comes from Skeletal, who says that Min Min becomes one of the single hardest characters in the game to play against people with matchup knowledge, due to her poor frame data and lack of answers to shield. So as someone who is not biased in any way and is definitely not tempted to spread certain narratives about Min Min, this statement is 100% correct. In all seriousness though, I do believe with absolute certainty that Min Min is one of the most misunderstood characters in the entire game. One day, I really want to make a video fully going through this character to disprove all the notions about her that are driven by a blind, ignorant rage, caused by that elite smash Min Min you lost to that one time because you have no idea what you're doing in the matchup. Oh, jeez, I guess I got a little heated there. You know what, I've been doing all of these other hot takes from different people, but do I have any hot takes of my own? I suppose it's only fair for me to reveal a hot take from yours truly, Rister Mice, who says that most Smash players have absolutely no clue how to dress themselves properly, and just come to Smash tournaments looking like they walked out of a clearance aisle. If only there was a company that could help them with that. Wait a minute. That's right. Today's video is partially brought to you by Into the AM an apparel company that's partnered with my channel. They're dedicated to helping you chase your passions by outfitting you with the most stylish and comfortable clothes for the occasion. Whether you're playing at a local, commentating at a regional, traveling to your first major, or just headed over to a buddy's house for some practice, Into the AM has got what you need to look your absolute best. They've got graphic tees, basic tees, polo shirts, tank top, flannels, short sleeve henleys, long sleeve henleys, things that aren't even shirts like shorts, joggers, or hoodies. I understand that some of these might seem expensive to you at first, but keep in mind, they're in a pack. And if you add on the site-wide sale that goes up to 40% off, then you're really getting a steal. And what if I told you that you can get them for even cheaper by using my coupon code RISTER? There may not be any money in competitive Smash Bros, but that doesn't mean there has to be no money in your wallet. You'll be thanking me for these savings, but again, only if you use my coupon code RISTER or any of my affiliate links. Now, where were we? Ah, that's right, hot takes. Our next hot take comes from Dogecaster, who says that crew battles are great and should happen more often. I think this is the most correct hot take we've had in this entire episode. Crew battles were awesome. I mean, just take a look at the North America versus Japan crew battle that took place a long time ago at Frostbite 2019. This crew battle, for a lot of people, was their introduction to competitive Smash as a whole. It was a spectacle, and it united people all across the globe. For a more recent example, take a look at Collision 2024, Heroes vs Villains. This was the whole theme of the tournament, and the crew battle was fittingly epic. Smash can be so much more of a spectacle than it currently is, and this exhibition is perhaps one of the best examples. So yes, more crew battles, please. They're extremely fun, and you can get really creative with the theming. Next up is Boxacel, who says that a battle arena is better practice than quick play, and that Elite Smash does not determine skill. To be honest, I was on board until that last part. I think battle arenas are better practice when you're trying to actively improve at something. 
because a lot of times you can just hop into a voice chat with whoever you're playing against and talk to them about it. I mean, heck, as bad as it is, Nintendo even tried to implement a voice chat system directly into arenas. However, I disagree with the notion that Elite Smash is completely useless. Let's not forget that really good players use Elite Smash all the time. Take Onin for example. Onin is an Elite Smash grinder and has obtained one of the highest GSPs possible with their Steve. That's insane, and there is absolutely no way that that grind hasn't at least partially contributed to Onin's skill. Alright, things are getting pretty slow, so let's speed this up and do some rapid fire ones, shall we? Loco Soko says the meta is far from being fully solved and we will definitely see more changes in the future. Correct! SSBU Me says that Sonic isn't top 3. Incorrect. Mudkip says that if you lose, you were the worst player in that moment. Uh, uh, maybe? Corny says Bowser Jr. is mid tier, people sleep on the character. Wait, I'm confused. Do you think that Bowser Jr. is mid or that he secretly slept on? Those two things seem like contradictory statements. Titus says that Ness F Smash needs the ability to be angled. Why? You literally have up smash and down smash, one of the best two framing options in the game. Eat Your Helmet says that grapplers like DK, Ensign, Luigi, Brawler, and Ice Climbers are the true anti-meta characters, because while they aren't exactly better, they have the best tools to disrupt the game plans that drive the current meta. Uh, you're probably right, but to be honest, I spaced out like halfway through that and have no idea what we're talking about anymore. And lastly, Canadian Nerd says that Ultimate as a competitive game is absolutely terrible. Hey, wait a minute, I thought these were supposed to be hot takes. Man, I... No, we can't end the video like that. We've gotta find one more. A really good one. A really thought-provoking one. One that shakes the foundation of the community. Let's see, it's gotta be in these replies somewhere, but where? Wait, this is it. At the very bottom of my post. From Adney, the ultimate hot take. Fundies do not exist, and this term only exists to think you are superior to others. Wow, I mean, it's great. It's a truly thought-provoking hot take on the nature of the game, and I get it. There are no fundies in Smash Ultimate. We're all cheesers. We just want to feel better about ourselves by saying we have fundies. It's perfect. Wait a minute, there's one more. What is this? From Weatherman211, it's just a screenshot of the prompts to block me on Twitter. And if I go to their profile, then... Hmm. Yeah, I... I'm not sure what I expected, to be honest. That's going to be it for today's video. Before I go, shout out to my patrons Seth Laster, Logan S, Persipom, Wawa, Mr. Sinister, Happy Feet, Ocean Man, Misty Bot, and my tier 2 patrons Iltis, Diamond Blaze, and Ben L. Additionally, shout out my YouTube members Teacher Jr., Defective, Boston R, Gonna B, Kirby Fan, Nexus, Loco Soco, and my tier 2 members Mike G, Wu Tang Forever, and Storm Trooper. Lastly, Extra special thanks to my tier 3 supporters, Fat Blizzard, who says Big D will make it out of his slump, Avidune, who says Mr. Rice is the go to smash content, Iltis, who says MKLeo always comes back, and Grant I am. If you want to support me using any of these methods, links are in the description down below. Don't forget to use my coupon code RISTER in order to get 10% off of any order from Indie the AM. And lastly, I want to give one last sincere thanks to Lemme Fly for their continued support of my channel. Link to their Twitter page is also in the description. Don't miss my next upload. But until then, I've been Mr. Mice, and thank you all so very much for watching.